Bonjour tout le monde, welcome to another episode of the Point of No Return podcast, where we go behind the scenes to understand the secrets and strategies of the most interesting Canadian technology companies. On this week's show, I had the pleasure of speaking with Chloe Ryan, CEO and founder of Acrylic Robotics. Uh, I hope you listened to this one because I think it was a good, uh, really good episode. Chloe is a, uh, a quintessential startup entrepreneur, has an idea, goes to market with this robotics AI company, uh, looking to uh, really innovate in the art space. It's really stage startup and I love talking to early stage founders just because the uh, their passion and infusion about the idea that they're going after. Uh, before Acrylic, um, Chloe was a serial entrepreneur at the age of nine, sold her first painting and was a prevent, provincial level ca- athlete throughout her teens. And she's built a sustainability case competition and managed million dollar infrastructure projects at uh, Canada's largest consulting firm, WSP. And now she's uh, working at a tech startup that she founded called Acrylic, looking to make fine art accessible to art, to art. And we really dive into the business model, uh, understand the different opportunities, and maybe some s- philosophical conversations about robots and where all this is going. Her model is to leverage robotics and AI to allow artists to create authenticated, limited edition uh, co- collections of artwork. Uh, so you can you can see the potential about this of this idea to really help really democratize art for artists and make it more of a mainstream uh, type of industry rather than very kind of premium and uh, so that's it. I really hope that you enjoy today's episode. Chloe, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, I'm really happy that you took the time to, to be on the episode today. Uh, you strike me as a very, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, overachieving individual. One that's really has you know f- goals that, that you've set and want to achieve them. You've spoken about wanting to be an entrepreneur. So curious if you've done any introspection in terms of like what led you to wanting to be an entrepreneur? What led you down this path? Hey, yeah, nice, nice. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Super excited to be here. And I think that's a great question to start off with. I have always been a little bit of an entrepreneur. Um, I started my first, I, I'm not sure if I would quite call it a company, <laughs> but my first entrepreneurial venture was I was about nine years old in the schoolyard. I launched a toy brand. I had a big manufacturing line of peers making uh, making these toys at recess before the school shut us down. So, you know, I think it started pretty early and I've always had something going on in the background outside of my normal activities. So I think, uh, I think it, it's a bit, uh, it's a little bit innate, but I think the drive to want to turn it from just a little side passion project into a career stems from, I think just a lot of excitement about how fast the world is changing and realizing that especially technology and tech entrepreneurship, the impact that you can have through technology, you can have really, a very magnified impact on society and on sort of the future of where we're going. And that was, I think, really exciting. And so, yeah, I think a bit of an innate, I, I don't know exactly how I would describe it, a little bit of a je ne sais quoi. Um, I've always liked building things and leading people and a little bit of also, there's a lot of things that I would like to see changed in the world and entrepreneurship and technology uh, is sort of the tools that I need to to bring those to life. Interesting. I like how you 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 were like introspective and saying, "Hey, the, the tools I'm going to use to make the world better are going to be, you know, like building a company with entrepreneurship and technology." What led you down to choosing the world of art uh, and this intersection of art and robotics? Uh, I find it fascinating space. It seems like uh, obviously robotics is such a broad field. I'm curious, what led you down path that idea? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I get that question a lot. So I started out as an artist. Nothing, nothing wild. I was never in any big galleries or anything like that, but I've always been painting, drawing, creating, and I would sell my works to sort of the people around me. And that was sort of the catalyst for this. So there was a lot of problems that I had faced personally as an artist that I then, you know, they were just sort of the way things were. And then I studied mechanical engineering, which complete, uh, complete 180 degree change from visual art. But that was really where I realized that you know, a lot of these problems that I had chat that I had faced as an artist are totally solvable with the types of technology that exists today. And I think I focused on the world of art because it was something, I mean, it, something that I had personally experienced. Uh, and also I, from where the robotics comes in, I was never, uh, I mean, I was studying mechanical engineering, but I was never deeply interested in robotics, honestly, until starting acrylic where I've realized, you know, now I've developed this deep passion for robotics and artificial intelligence and, I think that a lot of the questions that we brush up against with acrylic in terms of what does it mean to be creative? What is, what is art? 
uh, you know, can a robot be creative are deeply fascinating topics that sort of keep me up at night now. And so, yeah, I think that fine art and sort of by, by extension creativity are really, really interlaced with all of the conversations that are happening now around, you know, artificial intelligence and humanoid robotics and, and this type of thing that make me very excited to have sort of, I guess, accidentally picked this space to be innovating in. Yeah. Before we go too deep and it's like, okay, like I already have like a million questions, but I guess <laughs> you have to explain what acrylic robotics is for, for the people listening. So if you mind giving your, the, 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 the quick pitch. Yeah. So the core of what we do is, is that we make art with robots, actual painted art with real paint on canvas. Expanding on that a little bit is we're building a way to allow artists to produce their works of art at scale and allow budding creators to create in sort of a more accessible, intuitive way. So what that actually looks like is it's a few different tools. Fundamentally, the secret sauce is that we've got these robotic arms that can actually redo brush strokes the same way that an artist does. So you can imagine a robotic arm dipping into paint, uh, you know, washing the brush, painting each layer stroke by stroke, and then we can take in that input from various different sources. So our first tool that we're launching soon is technology to go from digital art. So you paint something on a tablet, we can realize it, you know, in the real world with actual paint, large scale. And then we're also working on the technology to capture artist brush strokes in 3D space. So, you know, I'm actually sitting in my studio with real paints on canvas. We've built a camera system that can capture that. And then last but not least is, okay, that's phenomenal for practicing artists, you know, who've spent 10 years perfecting their craft and know exactly where they want to place each brushstroke. But how can we widen access to these types of tools by leveraging a lot of the really exciting generative AI tools that have, that have sort of exploded in recent months? And so that looks like how can we allow people to start with just a text prompt uh, command or start with an image uh, or a doodle and transform that into a work of art that can actually be painted by our robots in the style of a specific artist. So that was, I touched a little bit on a lot of the different projects that we're working on, but fundamentally it's how can we accelerate creativity and unlock that visual creativity within everybody and, you know, also make it easier for artists to make a living and also uh, more, you know, make fine art more accessible to the general public. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, so many great ideas. Is it safe to say that you guys are, let's say, pre product market fit in the sense of like, you don't have like, you're, you're not growing exponentially right now. You're still kind of like figuring out the exact business model. Is, is that a fair statement? Yes, fair statement. So we, we're, you know, we're working on a lot of different projects. We are about to launch the digital one. And so we're starting to find, uh, starting to work with our first artists now. And then we'll we'll we'll, we'll grow from there. So yeah, a lot of different ideas. Digital is going to come first. Yeah, I was yeah. like, okay, well, if you would, uh, you know, like give me some leeway to just brainstorm with you some on some of these ideas. Totally. Because <laughs> the first one I like where it's like, hey, I'm like, I'm a, I don't want to say starving artist, but I'm an artist that's, I know my craft, but I'm not, mm -hmm. not able to monetize it. Then I think that was the idea. I think I initially had latched on when I heard about acrylic was having uh having a robotic assistance to be able to replicate my art so i'm going to be able to instead of selling one painting for a thousand dollars because i need to eat this month i can sell you know 20 paintings for 20 bucks each or whatever so doubles my revenue so much lower price per painting but using my the exact same literally copy paste using using a robotic arm is that a, a fair um, encapsulation of that of that idea yeah, I would say that that's a fair encapsulation. It's really, you know, right now, if you think about how do I make a living as an artist, because I cannot produce, you know, at high volume, I therefore supply and demand, I need to increase demand by reducing access, increasing the prices that somebody was willing to pay per piece. And so it's sort of giving artists a new way to monetize art that, you know, does not involve having to sort of inflate those prices to, to the elite. And so, yeah, it's, it's the scale. I think that's the main value prop there. Thank you, Captain. What's interesting, and I was thinking about it for interviews, like, is there a lot of untapped demand, right? Because if you look at me, like someone that's clueless, kind of like pretending to be macho, mm -hmm. but it's like, oh, I like art, but I don't know how to recognize good art. But if you tell me if it's going to be much less expensive, because right now it's, let's say, a uh, supply constraint, like an artist can't make X number of paintings, but if there's much more supply, it's going to allow untapped demand to emerge, which I find interesting. Mm -hmm. That's exactly how I see it is, you know, th there are a lot of people out there who are not even participating whatsoever in the art market that I, well, I guess sort of our hypothesis is that they will. 
if you look at it right now, they're really, you know, you've got galleries selling pieces for thousands of dollars because they have to. That's their business model. And then you've got IKEA, mass-produced flat photo prints, and you really don't have anything in the middle. And that's a lot of people with blank walls. That's a lot of spaces with blank walls that can be replaced by art. And, you know, I mean, we can kind of get into this, you know, getting a little bit meta there. But I think if you look at pretty much every other form of creativity, so take, you know, the music industry or film or books, the technology has been invented to produce them at scale, bring them to the masses and widen sort of the market of people who listen to music. Pretty much everybody I know listens to music. Very few people I know uh, comparatively own a bunch of art pieces. And why is that? I think is kind of the question that we need to be asking. And can we widen that market? Yeah. I'm going to come back to like maybe a challenge on the business model because I find the tech itself might have other applicabilities, but I'm going, to, I'm going to park it for a second. I want to go to the other idea because you mentioned generative AI, which is obviously all, all the rage right now. And we've seen things like DALI 2 this year, which is just like mind blowing, which like, you know, put in, put in a keyword and it spits out essentially the exact same thing you've been, you've been typing in. Can you expand a little bit on that idea that you said you were exploring? It wasn't, it wasn't entirely clear to me. So yeah, I have so many thoughts about all of these new generative art tools. I am obsessed with them. I think that they're like the coolest thing ever. Uh, and I think, you know, <clears throat> what we're building in that space is very intimately related, but I guess I'll, I'll talk about sort of Dolly 2, or you can look at mid journey, stable diffusion. There's a lot of different models competing for who can create the best output. And I think that what's exciting about them is that they're allowing people to express themselves visually in ways that they never could. I, I was thinking about this and chatting with somebody recently. And the analogy that I kind of came to was, you know, it's as if we've been reading our whole lives without ever having been taught how to write. You know, we're consuming visual images day in, day out. We watch movies, we look at pieces of art, we see the world visually. It's the most important sense, I would argue. And yet, literally nobody has been able to communicate visuals. You know, you'll have this super cool image in your head that you can never express to other people. And I think that that's if anything, you know, sort of a fundamental loss in human connection. And very few people are able to dedicate the time required to become good enough at painting, good enough at drawing, to express that vision that you have that's a visual image in your head. So I think that the magic of Dolly 2 and, and these other tools that allow you to go from a text prompt for everybody, if you haven't seen it, you type in text, you know, for example, I want a cowboy with, uh, you know, antlers riding a horse through the sunset or whatnot. And it generates a few different varieties of these beautiful images. Um, I think the magic of that comes down to allowing people to express what's in their brain that they've never been able to. And that's why I think that they've been exploding. And I, I don't expect that to really, to really change. So those are sort of my thoughts, generally speaking, on, on Dolly 2. And I think that we will see them continue to grow. And I think that's a wave that we're sort of trying to, to tie ourselves into. And I guess the final piece I will say to, to make people think a little bit about, about these is that, I, you know, if you ask a kid to paint you a, a picture or draw you something, they'll, they'll draw you this random stick figure arrangement and you'll say, what is that an image of? And they'll say, it's a picture of all of the love in the universe <laughs> or something crazy. Like we think like that when we're kids and, you know, we lose that somehow. And I think that these tools, if anything, will help us get back and recapture that. And I think that that is so crazy and magical. Yeah, no, it's, it's, like you said, it's fascinating. It made me think of like the Sir Ken Robinson TED talk and you might've seen like, it's one of those, like back when TED, TED talks were a thing and they were cool. It was one of the original ones where it talks about how like, uh, this un untapped human creativity. We force kids to sit all day versus like do dancing or painting, etc. cetera. Um, have you thought about the next step of how the, your robotics application might be able to help, let's say using generative AI and technologies like stable fusion, et cetera, uh, or you? Yeah, no, totally. Uh, and, and I haven't actually watched that TED talk. I'll, I'll have to go, I'll have to go watch it after this, but I think that how we tap into that is that there's actually a lot of science that shows that when you look at a painted work of art, the sort of the, mirror, the motor neurons in your brain light up as you try and imagine how did the artist create this kind of piece. When you look at a flat photo print, things don't spark like that. You can't, you're not, your brain is literally not imagining the same things. And I, so therefore I think that there's a huge part of art 
that is lost when you're not able to be looking at something textured. It's why looking at sort of a digital image doesn't have the same magic feeling as going to a gallery and looking at a beautiful oil painting. And so I think that, you know, these tools just for visual communication will, will go wonders. But I think that if we want to go that extra step and beyond just sort of, here's what I'm thinking, look at what it looks like to, this is a work of art that has come from my brain. I think we are going to need to find a way to capture the essence of visual creation. That's been the same really core essence over, you know, centuries, which is, it's textured, it's painted, it's made with real materials. You can see the chronology there. And so that's where I think we come in of, we come in and say, okay, you've got this really cool image. How can we turn that into a painting that will actually be able to capture how you've been imagining things? And more than just that, but how can we also do it in a way that benefits artists? So right now, most of these generative art platforms or tools, you know, you can type in, I want that cowboy riding through the sunset in the style of, you know, you know, you pick an artist, uh, that artist never gets any proceeds. And that's sort of one of the big downfalls of a lot of these tools. And, you know, one of the reasons that they're coming under, under flack right now. And what we're trying to work on is, okay, how can we capture an artist's style and imbue that into the way that it's painted by us and give that artist royalties? So how can we capture both what is in your brain that you're trying to communicate and that you think is beautiful, that's custom to you, while also integrating that magic of an artist who spent decades perfecting their craft while benefiting them at the same time. So yeah, that's kind of the, that's kind of the tie in for us. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. While also, you know, like the artists themselves potentially getting disrupted, right. Where it's like all this like art is, is, is basically growing at an ex exponential rate when you could just have like a, you know, text command and be able to represent what happens to that artist right i think it's that's an important question not too many people are asking uh for the uh for your hardware itself are you producing the hardware are you buying off-the-shelf components so how does the robotic piece work i imagine the software you're 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 developing in-house but imagine the hardware piece is the the, the harder piece <laughs> literally yes and no so uh most of our hardware is actually not produced by us we are relatively hardware agnostic so we use six degree freedom robotic arms We've tried a whole bunch. We've we've uh, done a few small projects with actual, like actually other startups here in Montreal, Canova and Macademic. So testing it with their arms and then moving on to some others in the future. So we we link with other companies that have spent decades perfecting their robotic arms that have, you know, the best precision and stuff like this. We built some of other, our other mechanical components off the shelf for paint mixing and distribution and stuff like this. But most of the core tech that we've, we've been building is on the controls side. So, okay, we've got this sort of robotic hardware. How do we bring it to life in a way that is, you know, high fidelity to how an artist's movement patterns look like. And then also the software and the machine learning that powers a lot of these different tools, not to mention, you know, when we look at how can we capture brushstrokes in 3d space, all the sort of robotic motion capture technology. So yeah, a lot of the actual hardware, you know, we're, we're not in, you know, uh, supply chain manufacturing challenges, but it's a lot of the software controls. Yeah. Going back to the question I had before about like the other applications, right? Because you think of a brushstrokes of how precise they are, just the the sheer number of them, like hundreds slash thousands, right? Mm -hmm. Have you started considering, well, if we build, you know, said like the, the motion controls, the software, the machine vision that's necessary, can we solve for other problems beyond art? I'm thinking of like, obviously, you know, the, the dream would be is like surgery, right? So it's like someone that can, you know, you could replicate it, but... Um, obviously, that's probably not the best use case to start with, but have you started thinking about what else is possible once you guys build you know, the application side? We've kind of been thinking about that from day zero, not in a necessarily super active way in that I think we need to you know, really hone in and laser, be laser focused on the problem space that we're working in for, the, for it to actually <laughs> work well. But uh, there's a lot of future applications. I, fundamentally, the technology that we're building. So if I ignore sort of the generative piece and I focus more on how do we capture human movements and replicate them with robotics, that is a challenge that nearly every sort of humanoid robotics company is working on. Um, you know, how do I learn from humans? Surgical robotics is a big one. <laughs> We've, we've actually had a lot of surgical robotics researchers and other startups and companies come up to us and be like, oh, how do you do this? Like, yeah, well, you mentioned Kinova, software. right? Which is like basically trying to do that, right? So, well. Yeah, part of, part, of, uh, part, of their, part of their business model, I think, is, is, uh, is working with that. But um, yeah, so I definitely think that's a future potential application. Uh, but I do think that we need to be laser focused on, on art first. And 
we actually get a lot of, you know, we get a lot from these robotics companies is one of the reasons that they're interested in, in, you know, allowing us to, well, not allowing us, but having us explore sort of the boundaries of the robots that they build is that if you think about what are the classic things that robots can't do, it's art, it's painting, you know, it's these fine human delicate movements where, you know, a slight variation in pressure can really affect the output. So if we can master that, I think that, you know, that's a big step towards mastering a lot of other things that humans do with tools, teaching robots how to do them. Uh, and that could be menial tasks. That, you know, we look at automation of a lot of other industries. The easiest stuff is things that you can just pre-program that a robot doesn't need to learn from a human. But the more complex things, the more interesting things are, you know, what uh, the f- delicate things that a human needs to do first. There's a couple other interesting startups working on, for example, how to teach robots to be chefs. You know, you can have a robot just follow very specific commands, but to have the delicate flavors of a particular chef, you need to do it in a really specific way. And how can you train robots to mimic those particular patterns? So there's, yeah, there's a whole world of, of automation that I think is about to hit us. of yeah, you just, be human-like things. Yeah, you just blew my mind. Where it's like all the, you know, like, th- you know, three-star Michelin restaurants where it's like the chef has to have this specific ratio, you know, of salt or whatever. Mm-hmm. And yeah. now a robot can basically do it. If all the all that you know, all that uh, the, the robot needs to do is watch the chef once, and learn, and then copy paste it. So again, going back to this notion of like untapped demand, like a lot of people want to eat at those restaurants, but like I can't afford two thousand dollars, whatever it is. You can now do at scale, and maybe there's the high end experience for people that want to go in. But then there's going to be the more uh, a more uh, bud gam, like a lower price range uh, mm-hmm. that offers again just more opening it up the market. I don't know. It's, I find that as a fascinating idea. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think it's an idea that will permeate a lot of industries as we move forward. Um, yeah, and it even gets into the question of what is more authentic. You know, is a, a sous chef who studied, you know, a human sous chef who studied with that chef for you know five ten years. Is that a you know, and is learning the same recipes and is making them for you if the if that chef is homesick, is that still that chef's creation or is it the creation of that sous chef? If that original chef trained a robot instead of a sous chef uh, to to create the same meals, is it more authentic? Is it less authentic? And that's a question that we get a lot in the art space. Like a lot of you know, this actually is something that a lot of people find surprising. But a lot of the top art that you see in galleries often is not even you know made in whole or in part by the artist themselves like you know if you look at these big pieces from you know way back when it's often you know dozens of art assistants who are the ones fulfilling the sort of primary artist's vision who you know they go sort of unrecognized and you know we don't think of it as like not being by that artist but is is a robot really any different and is it maybe better if it's actually doing the exact same strokes that the original artist did first. Yeah. yeah. You said something interesting at the, at the beginning when you're talking about like, you know, you've been thinking a lot about robots and creativity. It's like, can robots be creative, right? Is that is that a question that we'll be able to answer? And uh, I, th- I think they can be, right? We're seeing it a lot with this art where we're seeing unexpected results, you know, for, from, from an algorithm. Yeah. Maybe we're going to start seeing it in a lot of different domains. It's like it's... I don't have the right answer, but it's one that's really interesting to ask. Um, maybe to go back to acrylic for a second. So, where are you at today in terms of commercialization, building the company? Like, uh, what big challenges and, and things are you working on? Yeah, and I, even maybe before we get to that, my my final sort of comment on that last question about can machines even be creative? That is something that I find deeply personally fascinating, and it's so exciting that we kind of get to brush that. And the the sort of thought that I'll throw out to you is, you know, is is human creativity really all that different from machine creativity in that, you know, we think of machines as being very good at pattern matching and analysis of patterns and of data. But a lot of these new generative AI tools, what's exciting is that they do feel a little bit creative. They're creating something that's brand new. And I think that that's really challenging us to think about, think about our very definition of creativity. Um, And you know, all we really do is take in inputs that are visual or auditory or whatever. You know, I look through all kinds of art that's come before me and I create something that is just really just my interpretation of these previous things. It's amalgamation. There's a, there's a quote that I really like that um, by William uh, Inge. I think that's how you pronounce his name. It's originality is undetected plagiarism. That I, <laughs> which, you know, you can have your own opinions on that, but 
Um, you know, all creativity is, is in a sense generative. You start with something, you create something else. And I think that machine creativity is maybe not entirely all that different. So we'll, we'll, that's, we could get philosophical there, but, uh, I don't know. It's a, the questions that are worth asking back to your other question about where we're at now. Uh, we're, we are, so we've, we've got a sort of MVP, I'd call it of our digital art product. So we did our first art show in Montreal last uh, last weekend. It's pretty exciting. And now we're looking to find our first artists to do our first sort of beta tests, pilot tests and stuff like that. Trying to find some artists who are really keen to be kind of the leaders of this next wave of, in the art world. We've seen a lot of AI art and I think robotic art is going to be next. We've already seen a lot of progress in this. So trying to find our first artists for that um, and actually start to, to roll that out while we are doing a bit of an R&D sprint for the generative art concept. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so it's trying different different uh, elements. And uh, you, you mentioned New York and you're trying to raise funding. So where are you in terms of like the, the capital side? Yeah, capital side, we wanted to get something that we could actually put on the market before focusing ourselves on fundraising. So now that we've got this that works, you know, we can prove it at a small scale that we can replicate these high fidelity pieces. Now it's time. <laughs> so, you know, starting probably in the new year, or not probably starting in the new year to to rain, raise our first proper angel round, uh, pre-seed round of financing to go from, okay, we've got this prototype that works. How can we start getting our first artists in and start, you know, being able to actually scale the digital product to be sort of self self provisioned while we focus on using all that data that we're collecting and using those artist connections and the brand and our ability to produce that high fidelity at a physically larger scale to uh, to launch ourselves into the generative art component that we've been that we were talking about earlier today. So that's where that fits in for us. Yeah, well, best of luck with acrylic robotics. I find it's, it's such an interesting concept. And it's like, I feel like, again, I have no idea about any of this space, but it's like, like you're going to figure something out. Like something is going to work here and it's going to explode. Um, you've mentioned yeah. in, in preparation for the, the, this conversation, you mentioned um, role models for you. And, you know, like how important it is for you also as a concept, you know, for having women founders, particularly in tech, where there aren't, you know, honestly, there aren't that many. And it's like, I feel horrible. My podcast is a horrible example of this, where it's like, there's still very male dominated. Uh, curious to hear you about the role of how role models have played in, in, your, in your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. <laughs> This is a question that I wish I had a better answer to. Like, I really wish I could say, oh, yeah, you know, my my journey was made you know, infinitely better because I had X, Y, Z role, female role models that had a big impact. There are just not that many female founders in deeply technical industries uh, and especially in robotics. They're, they're just <laughs> I, I wish I had a more positive answer. There just aren't that many. Uh, I think that you know, you have to really stretch far and wide. Like I look at, for example, Melanie Perkins, the founder of Canva, which is, okay, how can I bring graphic design to sort of the general public, making it more accessible? That was really inspiring. Um, or looking at other founders in the robotics space, uh, Suzanne Gilder, the, the, uh, one of the co-founders of Sanctuary AI, building sort of the next general purpose robots. Uh, also the former founder of Kindred AI, uh, female founder of a robotics firm with the largest exit in Canada, I think somebody quoted once. So there are some role models, and I think that's definitely inspiring to see. But I do think that the nature of being a female founder in a really technical field like this, especially in a smaller ecosystem like in Canada, uh, is that you sort of need to, I don't know, be your own role model a little, a little bit. <laughs> and I think also focus on, you know, being a role model for future founders in the, you know, because I did not have that many starting on this journey. So yeah, that's, I wish I had, I wish I had a more positive answer there, but it's a, it's a great answer. Yeah. Great answer. You're obviously you're, I find you're already inspiration. So like any, to anyone listening, I find you're going to, you're going to be, you know, the timestamp, right? Like November, 2022, we're look back <laughs> and say, wow. Like, uh, in terms of your journey, um, maybe a final question or two. It's like, have you thought of a broader vision for acrylic robotics, like uh, where you want to take the company, the kind of impact you you want it to have on the world? Whew. <laughs> think about this a lot. I think there's a few different directions there. In terms of impact, I, to me, it really comes down to creativity. I think it's such an important part of what makes us human, even though I realize I just sort of was an advocate for machine creativity, maybe not being all that dissimilar to human creativity. But I think that the experience of being creative has been one of the, you know, it's one of my favorite states to be in, that flow state of creativity. And I think it's it's 
kind of tragic how many people are not able to have that feeling because it's not very accessible and it's, you know, in a sort of a capitalist world, it's not it's not profitable really to be creative anymore. And I think that providing additional opportunities for people to make a living through being creative. And I'm not talking about the top 1% of artists who make up, a, you know, it's like something like 40% of all auction sales. Don't quote me on that statistic, but it's something around there. Uh, but sort of the general, the rest of the people, uh, rest of people, I think that making it easier for creative people to make a living through creativity is something that really, you know, lights me on fire and makes me excited and I think also just making our world a little bit more cr- creative. Like I, I look at where I, where I am right now and I look every building I go into, all my friends' houses, all the office spaces, and there's these white walls and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't inspire us to be creative in all the other spheres of our life. And I think that this might be a little bit idealistic, but the world needs more creative solutions to problems in all different kinds of industries. And I think that if we can have more art everywhere and more art, more artists having their messages conveyed to a wider array of people, not locked up in sort of private collectors' houses where nobody gets to see the art, I think that we'd have a more creative world overall. So that's what really drives me. And then beyond creativity, I'm personally deeply interested in you know the future of artificial intelligence, robotics, humanoid robotics. What does it mean if we can build a robot that can perform human-like tasks? And acrylic is really allowing us to to sort of, you know, rub right up against that concept. And I can see in the future, once we've got, you know, a robotic technology working for something as delicate and niche as the, you know, human art, human creativity, I can see that expanding to other capacities as well. But that's very far in the future. (laughs) Yeah, I love that answer. It's like, I think you've just pointed the right general direction, right? So we spoke a lot about robots, creativity algorithms, but I think one thing that, Machines are not going to replace anytime soon. Is human, real human creativity coming up with the idea of acrylic is not going to be an algorithm. It's going to be a person, right? So giving people a way out of doing repetitive, menial tasks and focusing on creative uh, mm-hmm. endeavor is going to be a huge unlock because, you know, the, uh, you know, like working the uh, coal mines is going to go away, right? It's going to be, you know, robots doing that kind of work. So I think you're definitely in the right mm-hmm. space. So it's like, yeah, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't wait to see you guys kind of go grow and grow the next step uh my final question for you chloe would be is people want to learn uh connect reach out what's the best way yes <laughs> excellent question so uh yeah i mean you can follow along we are pretty active on social media at acrylic robotics on instagram uh, facebook and, and linkedin as well or check out our website and in terms of specifically we are actively recruiting our first artists so exciting it's been so long up to this moment so if you know an artist or if you are an artist We'd, uh, we'd love for you to check out check out uh, some of our new tools. And if you're an art buyer or somebody who might be interested, we don't have any collections live yet. We did our first art show uh, a week ago and we're working to, to get towards our first collections. But check out our website and yeah, stay fo- follow our social medias um, because we will be releasing our first collection hopefully pretty soon, the next month or so. And yeah, I guess if, if there's any other ideas for collaborations, there's lots of different different people we can do projects with. So feel free to shoot me shoot me an email or find me on LinkedIn or something like that. It's Chloe Ryan from Acrylic Robotics. Chloe, thank you so much for your time. This was great. Yeah, thank you so much. As always, thanks for listening and don't forget to subscribe. If you want to learn more, check out thepnr.com.